Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1, and I'm going to go all the way to verse 17, though our passage for consideration will not be all of those verses. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they <clears throat> immediately sprung up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, <clears throat> they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? I'm thankful to know that I'm not the only preacher that why questions are asked when I'm done preaching a sermon. Why did you say that? Why did you do that? You know, so Jesus had that as well, right? Why? Why? Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Are you already thinking, what in the world is that supposed to mean? What, uh, how can you have taken away from him what you don't have? If you have? Whoever does not have even what he has. So there's, these, there's some difficulties in Jesus' words. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because... Seeing, they do not see. And hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. So is he speaking to parables to make it clearer for them? Some people have actually come to that interpretation here that what you're going to hear this morning is not true at all. But rather, Jesus is speaking in parables because they didn't understand. So he's speaking in parables so that they can more clearly understand. That makes no sense, it seems to me, as we continue reading. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. Isaiah makes it more of a causal thing. That is, the things that are being preached by Isaiah is more a cause of their blindness. Jesus says, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. In other words, he's speaking to people who are already, shall we say, made up their minds. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower, and he continues to address his disciples. So Jesus is, has come out of the house that we were in with him at the end of chapter 12. It seems like this is a full day for Jesus. 
Uh, on the same day, he said at the beginning in, in verse 1, on the same day, these things are happening. The same day where a lot of other things had been happening. And so Jesus went to the, to the seaside, to the beach, almost as if to get away and maybe get a little relaxation, watch the sunset or something. But of course, that didn't happen. As Jesus moves from the house to the seaside, crowds began to follow him. They gathered around him. In fact, there were so many people that they pressed against him, is the implication of the text, verses 1 through 3, and actually moved and pushed him to another location, which was into a boat, where he could move away from the shoreline and of all things address the people. It, it, it wasn't, I'm tired, I'm worn out, I don't have anything left. He continues on in his public ministry. Knowing their hearts and the needs of his disciples, that is knowing the hearts of the multitudes and knowing the needs of his disciples, Jesus chooses at this point to set forth truths concerning his kingdom. Now, he talked about his kingdom already, but here he is choosing to express truths concerning his kingdom that would reveal to those who had ears to hear, to no others, only to those who had ears to hear, what to expect as his kingdom was established in this world. And so this chapter includes eight parables. It seems that most people say seven parables, but if you count them, you'll find that there are eight. One of them is a little old bitty one toward the end uh, where he says in verse 52, then he said to them, therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out. So that's a, an eighth parable. And some would say, well, that's not really a parable of the kingdom, but I in, I'm including that. There's at least seven and I would say eight parables that Jesus gives. Four of those parables are spoken to the multitudes. And four of them are spoken only to his disciples, the final four. Beginning in verse 36, you see Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And when it says his disciples, it's not necessarily just the twelve. And I think it's in Mark's gospel where it was, says there were others with his disciples or the twelve. So there were, we don't know how many, but this included all of those who at that time were closely following Jesus called his disciples. And our goal today is to consider why Jesus spoke in parables. And Jesus answers that question specifically in verses 10 through 17, as well as verses 34 and 35. Jesus' words explaining why he spoke in parables has stirred up plenty of discussion. And I've been wrestling with this, uh, actually, even before this last week, because I knew I was coming to chapter 13, and chapter 13 has not always been an easy chapter for me. If parables are supposed to be so easy to interpret, I haven't found them so. And they need some explanation. I'm thankful that Jesus does give explanation for two of them. And I think in doing that, he gives us some clues as to how we are to interpret the others. But in verse 9, what we see in these parables is both judgment and blessing associated with his reasons, as, as we're going to see. But in verse 9... This, stands, this stood out to me, and it, and it really affected me in the things you're going to hear today. And there's a lot about hearing, there's a lot about ears and seeing as well, but which are basically saying the same thing in a different way. Verse 9, Jesus says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And that is Jesus' ultimate desire. Now, the purpose for speaking parables includes more than that, but that seems to be his ultimate desire, that those who have ears to hear would hear. They have a responsibility. He's not speaking to sea breeze. I've heard some preachers say, even if there was no one, they would preach anyway. I, I don't see Jesus doing that. I, I, see, I don't see him just speaking to the air. But he's seeking to reach those who have ears to hear. 
At the same time, he's clarifying through parables the true nature of his kingdom, which has been present and operative in this world for nearly 2,000 years. In other words, what we're reading, what we're going to see as we work through chapter 13 is what has been unfolding for nearly 2,000 years, the kingdom of heaven on earth. So while this is not the first time Jesus spoke in parables, is it, it is at this point that he chose to speak an entire message in parables related to what he calls the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven in verse 11. Now just for a moment, let me speak about a parable. What is a parable? And again, there, there are volumes that are written on these things. And sometimes by the time you finish reading the volume, you're, you're no clearer than when you began. And so sometimes it's just nice to hear a simple expression of what something is. And so a parable is an obvious real life event or experience told to illustrate and to teach a less obvious spiritual truth. There is typically one main thought that is being focused on in a parable, but that doesn't mean there aren't other things that are being said in the parable, as Jesus actually makes that very clear in his interpretation. But interpretations of parables must not contradict more clear propositional truth in Scripture. In other words, I warn you and me against building our theology on the parables. But what we ought to be seeing in the parables is a, an expression of truth that is clearly set forth in other more what we would call propositional expressions. And those who are given a heart to know the truth will have eyes to see deeper spiritual meaning. And let me say this, you won't just have eyes to see. If you have eyes to see, you'll have a heart to desire it. You, you want to see. Those who have no heart to know the truth will make of a parable what was not intended. Truth will be concealed to them, and they'll make something of it, maybe. And there's a lot of foolishness that has come forth from parables, a lot of heresy that has come forth from the parables. And we certainly want to guard ourselves against that. And so there is by nature both clarity and obscurity in Jesus' parables. Sometimes when you read what Jesus, Jesus answers to why he speaks in parables, sometimes you might focus all on the obscurity. He's hiding something. He's concealing something. Well, 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 there's a sense in which that's true, but that's not the only reason for parables. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. And so they, the ones who have ears to hear are those who know that the one speaking is communicating something of value. They're not just telling stories. They're not just entertaining you. And so they're listening intently. What is he saying? And then Jesus uses this expression, mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. In verse 11, and I believe that expression is central to these parables, the idea of mysteries. He says, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Now, a mystery is that which remains hidden or secret until it's revealed. It's a mystery. Something is being revealed to those who have ears to hear. That's what Jesus means when he speaks of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's something that's hidden, but it is going to be revealed. It's going to be made known. It was no mystery to the religious Jews that God promised a kingdom. The Old Testament scriptures, especially the book of Daniel, was clear on that. And they, they understood something about that. Daniel wrote, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And they heard those words, and for centuries they had heard those words as applying to national Israel only and politically. 
as I would assume most of you already know. In fact, that was such a central part of their thinking that they, you remember in John chapter 6, they sought to make him king. Now, if all Jesus was doing was coming to the earth to establish a kingdom with national Israel as the king of national Israel, why on earth would he have refused their attempt to make him king? There's something more going on. And this is the mystery. The mystery was the nature of this kingdom, something which Jews, by and large, did not comprehend. The nature of this kingdom, that in this present world, until the final manifestation and eternal fulfillment, the, the kingdom of heaven was not going to be as dominant, as predominant, as what they thought it would be, and it's not going to be limited to national Israel or to ethnic Jews. George Ladd, whom I admit I owe a lot of my understanding of matters relating to the, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God to over the years, he's been a great help. And if you have never read anything by him and you're interested, let me know. I can recommend some things. But he said this, the new truth, when Jesus says it's, it's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, something is going to be unveiled. The new truth now given to men by revelation in the person and mission of Jesus, is that the kingdom which is to come finally in apocalyptic power, as foreseen by Daniel, has in fact entered into the world in advance in a hidden form to work secretly within and among men. You see, Jesus is revealing things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Flip over to verse 34 and 35. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Does that sound like familiar language? Romans chapter 16 and verses 25 through 27, the Apostle Paul says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. And here is Jesus sent from heaven, come to this earth to make clear, to make known things that had been kept secret. And then through the Apostle Paul, there is the, there is the continuing unveiling of those mysteries. And it is the gospel. But now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith to God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. The kingdom of heaven is not, and I say this because there are many who speak this kind of language. They say the kingdom of heaven, Jesus intended to establish the kingdom of heaven when he came the first time, but he postponed that. And they talk about the postponed kingdom. And so there is no kingdom now. There is no kingdom of heaven. There is no kingdom of God. It's waiting until after this age. But that, that's not what the Scriptures teach. In 1 Peter chapter 1, I'll read it to you again. I read it in the Scripture reading time. Verse 10 through 12, Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that should come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating so the Spirit of Christ in them was leading them to write the things they wrote and was indicating things to them, but they weren't altogether sure what it was they wrote about it. When He testified through them 
beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would come. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Spirit, Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven involve those things that Old Testament prophets spoke of but didn't see clearly, which is really the point Jesus is making back in Matthew 13 and verse 17 when he says, For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And he's not saying that they weren't saved men, that they weren't part of the elect. It's just that they were seeking to understand things that were, that were cloudy, that were unclear. They were veiled to them. But now here, here's Jesus, the fulfillment of Old Testament Scriptures, the fulfillment of the prophecy standing before them, and they are seeing and they are hearing with, with clarity the things that they spoke of in cloudy ways. Jesus is saying, really, his disciples were seeing and hearing fulfillment. And how much more of you and me on the other side of the resurrection and the imparting of the Holy Spirit, how much more are we, as Peter says, as the Holy Spirit preached through the gospel, those very things which the prophets wrote of, Christ came to clearly set forward and then has been preached now for nearly 2,000 years, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But because the meaning of Jesus' parables was not immediately clear to the disciples, we saw that in verse 36. They came to him and asked him, explain the parable of the of the, of the tares of the field. Explain that to us. They, they didn't understand the parable of the sower either. Jesus explained, they didn't understand the parables without an explanation. And they knew the multitudes would not understand. Therefore, they asked, probably after the fact, the message preached, then he, they gathered with him in the house. And, and there probably is when they asked him, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus' response is not what you would expect from an evangelist who's trying to get a following. Following. But Jesus is not trying to get a following. Jesus is not trying to be king. Remember what has already been said back in chapter 11, I, verse 25, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. And so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. Je Jesus was not limping along, trying to accomplish something. That this is, speaking in parables is not an expression of defeat. And I said, well, I give up on y'all. I'll just throw parables at y'all. That, that's not what's going on. That everything is happening according to plan. God's purpose. The scriptures are being fulfilled. You see. But Jesus is being resisted. And his disciples are seeing this, not only the 12, the others, they're seeing this. And it's like they thought they were, maybe I'm saying too much here, but it's maybe they thought, maybe I'll say maybe, they thought they were catching on to a right, something big. I mean, this is the Messiah. They believed he was a Messiah. And something big is on the horizon. And they're, they're getting on board. Judas really thought that way. And when he came to see that it wasn't that way, you know what he did. Is he really intending to establish a kingdom? It doesn't look like it. People are Listen to what people are saying about him. And the crowds are being swayed and they're questioning. And, and yeah, they're following. But really, what's going on? What's their purpose for following? And these parables are given to reveal that. And so his kingdom message that he delivers will be received with understanding by those who have ears to hear and will expose those who do not have ears to hear. And that's where we're going in this message. In verses 11 through 17, Jesus answers the why question. 
and he uses parables that fit his purpose as he makes the nature of his kingdom known. Now, let me set this out to begin with. Jesus, if you read the, if you read verses 10 through 17, and of course you'll see it in the parables themselves, we'll see that especially in the parable of the sower and even the wheat and tares. But Jesus distinguishes two categories of people that are represented before him and really are represented in the world, but he's speaking to those who are before him. You remember what the scriptures say. Not all Israel is of Israel. But, 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 but I, Paul said, well, will their unbelief make void the promises of God? Is that the way it goes in Romans chapter 3? Will their unbelief destroy the promise, the purpose of... Will God not be able to accomplish His purpose if they remain in unbelief? And the answer is, God forbid. God is faithful. And that's what Romans is 9 through 11 is, 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 is much about that issue. And so as Jesus looks upon his inquiring disciples and thinks about the crowd, the question that they've asked him, he, he gives this answer, and his answer distinguishes two categories of people. There's you, the disciples, and then there's others, the others. There's them, you and them. Verse 11 because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. You, the inquiring ones, it's been given to you to know. Do, do you hear grace in that? It's, it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. You see, the disciples are not smarter, better, or more deserving than the multitudes. And Jesus is wanting His disciples to understand the nature of the kingdom. The nature of this kingdom is not to envelop every single soul on planet earth. That, that is not the goal. Now, see, that, that, that can disturb us a little bit. Because that's kind of what we want to think. But that's not what Jesus says. The capacity to understand kingdom truths, gospel realities, is given. It is of grace. What makes you to differ? Boy, if that doesn't bring a spirit of humility to you, what makes you to differ? And if that doesn't... Maybe produce a little bit of thankfulness. I don't know what will. Verse 16, blessed are your eyes for they see. Blessed are your eyes. Your ears for they hear. It's all of grace that there are any who see and hear. Mr. Spurgeon said, to hear the outward word is a common privilege. They all heard. When Jesus says, hearing, they do not hear. Seeing, they do not see. They have the outward capability. To hear the outward word is a common privilege. He goes on, to know the mysteries is a gift of sovereign grace. Our Lord speaks the truth with much boldness. It is given unto you, but to them it is not given. Solemn words, Spurgeon says, humbling truths. Salvation and the knowledge by which it comes are given as the Lord wills. There is such a thing as distinguishing grace after all. Let the moderns revile the doctrine as they may. And so in verse 17, we alluded to that a moment ago. The specific blessings for New Testament believers is, and especially for those standing before Jesus right then and there, they were seeing and hearing Jesus. We see and hear Jesus as we read the Scriptures and as we perceive and understand that He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophetic message. We are in the company of these disciples. Most Jews were blinded.
But in verse 12, it seems that Jesus drops in this thought of human responsibility. When he says, for whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Jesus is emphasizing to the disciples who are the ones who were given to know the mysteries of the kingdom, who have because it was given to them to know. They have that desire, that interest, and the ability. He emphasizes to them the responsibility or the accountability of these recipients of grace to respond to the things that they are hearing. Jesus is saying, To them, as he says to us, your response to what you are given is critical to receiving more. And that's a biblical principle that I'm not going to track through Scripture, but it's a pretty familiar one, I think. That you have been given the capacity to know does not eliminate your responsibility to respond in order to grow. You have a responsibility. Well, that's one group, those who are the recipients of this grace, it's given to you to know. And then there's the other group that's not been given to them, verse 11, but to them it has not been given. There were multitudes whom Jesus knew were not coming to him as Messiah. And Jesus says they are left to their natural capacity to see. They are left to their natural capacity to hear. They're left to their natural capacity to interpret according to natural reason. And if a person is left to his natural capacity, he will not receive the things of the Spirit of God because the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And so Jesus sees the Jewish multitude as ones who had advantages that they did not respond well to. I thought about that in the first hour. In fact, a couple of things that Michael said in the first hour, certainly you can hear it in this message as well. And here you see that idea of advantages, but advantages not taken advantage of. Remember Lot's wife. But whoever does not, verse 12 says, whoever does not have even what he has will be taken away from him. It was helpful, at least in my mind, to flip over to Luke chapter 8 and see what Jesus says there. It's in a The same context, Luke is just recording things differently. And it says in verse 18, and this may have been at a different time, but the the purpose of parables is being explained in Luke chapter 8. And this is what Jesus says according to Luke in Luke 8, 18. Therefore, take heed how you hear. And of course, the subject is hearing. For whoever has... To him more will be given. So if you're hearing with hearing ears, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. If you're hearing with those kinds of ears, that's receiving what you're hearing, responding to what you're hearing, then more will be given. And whoever does not have even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. And so that seems to be the idea. That seems to be the idea. That which they seem to have. They they have the capacity. There's even some indication that maybe they are hearing, but if they're not responding, if they're not utilizing, if they're not taking that advantage of having the very king standing before them, and acknowledging him for who he is, and pursuing that which he is saying, then what they even have will be taken from them. Light will be removed, and no access to the blessings of the kingdom of God. Beloved, this is still true. And this is one of the reasons why we are warned. 
in places like Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, you hear this, Therefore, we must give the earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away, or lest it, it goes through our hands like sand, like, lest we lose it. And then in chapter, chapter 3, Today, if you will hear His voice, Do not harden your hearts. Jesus sees that generation of Jews to be filling up Isaiah's dark prophecy. And I call it a dark prophecy because I don't know, you can read it and try to... In fact, one thing that I have not wanted to do in this message is to make Jesus say something He's not saying. Just to make everybody feel better. And these are hard words. But Jesus says in verse 14, and in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. In who? In those who are seeing but not seeing, hearing but not hearing. They don't understand. Hearing. Isaiah said, you will hear. And by the way, if you go back to Isaiah, this is, I mean, you remember Isaiah had seen the Lord, and that is a manifestation of Christ. He had seen the Lord, and then, and then the question is asked about ministry to the, to the nation, and, and Isaiah says, Lord, here am I. Whom, I. whom shall I send, and who will go for us, the Lord says. Isaiah says, here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, and this was his ministry. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. This was a a judgment upon the nation of Israel who had so embraced sin, so Isaiah 1, Jeremy, so laid hold, we talked about that yesterday, but it had so laid hold of sin and it so characterized their lives, they had so turned against the Lord in rebellion against the, the one who had manifested His love to them and His care for them. Isaiah, go preach to them. But don't go preach to them for the recovery. Preach to them and in that preaching. And it's an unenviable task for sure. But by your preaching, you will be confirming Israel's judgment by that preaching. And Jesus is saying that that prophecy is fulfilled. It's being filled up. The idea of fulfilled there is being filled up even in that which Jesus is doing and speaking in parables. He is saying that his preaching parables to the multitudes without interpretation was sealing them in their willful blindness and hardness of heart. Now you heard that. Their willful blindness. And you see how Jesus quotes Isaiah's words. He actually doesn't quote from the Hebrew. He quotes from the Septuagint. And I'm not going to go into all of that. But he doesn't say it the same way Isaiah says it. Isaiah 6, 9 and 10. He says, for the hearts of the people have grown dull, verse 15. Their ears are hard of hearing. This is why I'm preaching in parables. It's because of the condition of the people. They have shut their eyes. They've closed their eyes. Lest they should see with their ears and hear with their ears. In other words, they don't want to hear it. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should Heal them. And if you you'll find that passage in Isaiah 9, or excuse me, 6, verses 9 and 10, you'll find it referred to at least six times in the New Testament. It is a, a major emphasis in the New Testament. It is seemingly announcing an, an irreparable condition. Consistently applied to those who repeatedly and soundly reject 
gospel advantages. I want to turn to one of them, Acts chapter 28. The Apostle Paul in Rome meets up with Jews. Verse 23, so when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God. Now, now Paul understood the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Paul used the word mystery more than anyone else in Scripture, or at least in the New Testament. And so those mysteries were, were more fully unfolded in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. But he, he, he testified of the kingdom of God and the true nature of that kingdom, persuading them concerning Jesus. There is no kingdom apart from the king. There's no kingdom apart from Jesus. And by the way, there is no kingdom apart from the cross. Jesus, I understand this gets into eschatology a little bit, but, but, but it, it troubles me when I hear this thought that Jesus, if Israel, if the Jews had, had accepted Jesus as king, he would have established his, his kingdom on earth at that point. But my question is, what about the cross? That kind of sounds like what Satan tempted Jesus. Hey, bow down to me and I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. You can skip the cross and get the kingdom. Right? But that, that can't happen. Jesus had to suffer. He had to go to the cross. Or there would be no kingdom. The kingdoms of the world would win. The kingdom of darkness would win. That couldn't happen. And Paul knew that. That's why there is no separation from the gospel and the kingdom of God. It's the gospel of the kingdom of God. Persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken and some disbelieved. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our father. So what Isaiah said are the words of the Holy Spirit. By the way, the word of God is the word of the Holy Spirit. Saying, go to this people and say, hearing you will hear and shall not understand and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their ears and hear with their ears, see with their eyes and hear with their ears lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. The door being shut to that group of Jews. And then as you keep working and through the scriptures, you come to Romans chapter 11 and you, and you see this same passage in a shorter version of it expressed when Paul wrote about the hardness, the blindness that had been judicially, judicially pronounced, had come upon the Israel as a nation. But all of that was in the purpose and plan of God. The gospel came to the Gentiles. But oh, listen, this principle still remains true to this day. And so Paul writes in Romans chapter 11 and verse 20, a verse, well, I could read a number of verses here. He says, Verse, 11, verse 20, well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith. He's talking to Gentiles. Do not be haughty. That was Israel's downfall, among other things perhaps. But don't be haughty, Gentiles. Verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Verse 25, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile has come in, and all Israel will be saved, as it is written, and so forth. And all Israel will be saved. And I'm not, not going to launch off into what all that means, but I'm telling you the purpose of God is not thwarted by the unbelief of either Jews or Gentiles. In fact, He has concluded them all in unbelief that He might have mercy upon all. He goes on to say in Romans 11, Jew and Gentile. Now, let me just insert this thought here. God blinds and hardens no one against their will. Now, you may wrestle with me on that one. But I believe that's true. 
In other words, God doesn't need to make men unwilling. He must make them willing in the day of His power. The Bible never says that He must make men unwilling. That's you by nature. You say, well, God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And you also know, if you know that, that Pharaoh hardened his own heart, right? You say, well, which is it? Well, it's both. It's both. That's why back in our text in Matthew 13, verse 13, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. They willingly close their eyes. They willingly resist. That's why he is speaking in parables. But if you go to Mark's account, it says, it doesn't say, therefore I speak to them in parables because. It says, I speak to them in parables so that. Which is true. Both. There comes a point in time where there is a hardening that happens, where there is no return, there is no hope. It is over. Okay, so why? So his, just understand this. The ones Jesus had in view were not loving him and desiring to hear the truth, and he chose to prevent them. He didn't speak parables because they were just wanting to come to him. He said, I'm going to stop that. No, I, I agree with what you said in the first hour. Those who desire to come, Jesus does not say, no, I didn't pick you. You don't see that in the Scriptures. His message to them in parables, in a sense, brought to conclusion what was already at work in them and confirm them in that place of darkness. So then, why does Jesus speak to them in parables? So there's two of these two groups of people that are in the crowd, they're going to be speaking. Some of, them, some of them are already identified as disciples, some of them not yet. But Jesus is speaking parables to expose the two categories of people. And this helped me when I saw this. He's exposing those who hear and those who don't. And you might even say those who want to hear and those who don't want to hear, knowing that those who want to hear, it's by the grace of God. And those who don't want to hear are left to their own natural inclination. But the same message is, is delivered. And that's one of the things we'll see in the parable of the sower. The same message was delivered, but with different results as the parable of the sower will tell us. Like Paul said of the preaching of the gospel, it is to those, to the one, the savor of death unto death, and to the other, the savor of life unto life. That's what happens in the preaching of the gospel, 2 Corinthians 2.16. Disciples are identified by their seeing and hearing with eyes and ears opened. Open to truth and desiring the truth. That's why they asked questions. The disciples came to Him asking Him questions. I don't believe they were accusatory questions. They wanted to know, what's this parable about? To the disciple, the follower of Christ, the one who has... It's been given to them to know. They have ears to hear. Parables are not just interesting stories that we can do artwork with, but they convey to them vivid spiritual realities that are seen and that are heard and that are responded to. This is growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. You know that it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven if you are responding in your heart to what is being revealed through the parables. How, how do you come to these? Uh, listen, I was challenged at this point. I found myself, and I, I don't want to be too transparent here, 
But I'm going to tell you, my wrestlings were true, genuine, deep, deep, deep wrestlings with this, with this text and this passage. I had trouble with it. And I had to ask myself, am I one that has ears to hear? Do I really want to hear? Do I really want to know? I mean, I, I don't like some of the things that I'm seeing. Did I just say that? There was some of that at work in me. But crying out to God in prayer, and I'm going to tell you something, if you're struggling in your mind with anything, the best thing you can do is not listen to a preaching message, is not just simply reading the Bible, is to get on your face before God and cry out to Him. Cry out to Him. And it's amazing how He, he comes and He answers and he gives help. He really does. He does. I, I'm, a, I'm a testimony to it. And you know then that you are a disciple. Because you want to know. You want to hear. You don't, you don't want to fight against what God's saying. You don't want to fight against the truth that's being delivered. You want to understand what is he really saying. And then whatever that is, you want to receive it and respond to it. That's a, that's a disciple. But the others, the others are identified by their indifference, by their increasing hardness of heart toward Jesus and the message of his kingdom through the parables. He says in verse 15, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. This is what's being filled up right there in his presence. And even to this day, we see this happening, not only among the Jews, but some but Gentiles as well. Their hearts are hard of hearing their their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. And so to the curious natural mind, a parable of Jesus is really no more than an interesting parallel of ideas, intriguing, mysterious, but it remains ineffectual, a dead Sort of a dead letter, a dead picture. It doesn't have any deeper meaning. It doesn't have any spiritual reality. There's nothing of Christ in it for you. There's nothing that you can see. There's nothing, no glory in it. And there's no response to it. There's no life impacting truth that's heard or seen. It's just a story. And if your response is like that and you continue or, or turn away from the king who's telling the story, there is a turning, a, a, a digression, we have to call it, from the message of the king, just as described in Isaiah's prophecy where, where there is a spiraling down. In fact, Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 4. We won't go there, but he talks about a spiraling down. And about verse 17 or so of Ephesians 4. And there he's speaking of the Gentiles. Jesus spoke parables because of willful ignorance, willful hardening. Do you remember what Peter wrote in First Peter chapter, or excuse me, Second Peter chapter 3? Of which things they are willfully ignorant. Willfully ignorant. And so the parables of Jesus, and really I, th I think we could say the Scriptures at large, become a form of judgment. The preaching of the Gospel doesn't help. It becomes a form of judgment to seal hardened ones in their hardness. And these are sobering words. And brethren, as we begin to look at the parables in a couple of weeks, a couple of things at least will happen. Many of us, I hope, will be overwhelmed by how blessed we are to have eyes to see and ears to hear. Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. That struck me. It didn't stri strike me just reading it. But it struck me at some point as I was reading and pondering. My eyes are blessed. My ears are blessed. 
I'm not better than you. I'm not better than the world. I'm not better than my family. I'm not better than anybody. I'm blessed. Because if I know if left to myself, I would be just like others that I know. Unmoved by anything Jesus said, unmoved by the gospel, unmoved by the cross. There'd be no glory in it. I would be a rejecter. But God, thank you. Thank you for your grace. And so as we move through these parables, I hope that that's going to happen with many of us, but some. And I, let me also say this, that, that as your eyes are open, you see that, that, that we're serving a king who's not defeated. And he's going to have his way. This, this brings me hope. It brings me hope for those who are not yet in the kingdom. Those whose eyes have not yet been opened, who are, who are right now seemingly even being hardened. And yes, on one hand, I, I, I struggle because of the things that I read that are true. But also I know because Jesus Christ is the king and all powers his, I have hope. But there may be some as we go through these parables who may be more gospel hardened with familiarity with what you hear and yet having no heart to understand. But let me say to you, listen to this. If you do not willingly close your eyes, if you don't willingly shut your ears off, don't daydream, don't treat what you're hearing with indifference, don't turn off your mind to it. Do, do you have the ability to not turn your mind off to something? I know you do because there's lots of things you don't turn your mind off to. And so I say to you, with whatever ability you have, in other words, whatever you've been given, don't lose it because you don't use it. And so you have that ability to, to listen, to, to think, to... to go as far as you can go. And if you don't close your eyes, your ears to what you're seeing and hearing, you might understand with your heart and turn. Do you see how he words that? He says, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. You could read that as a closed door or you could read that as almost a prodding. That this is what will happen if you see with new eyes, hear with new ears, what the Bible calls circumcised ears, a new heart, and understand with your heart within you and turn. And Jesus says, these are the ones who will be healed from their blindness, from their deafness to gospel truth that has bound them, bound you in your sin and kept you outside the kingdom. So there's hope. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray.